but this, this transition then is really uh, entirely the physics of you know, the crossovers at that scale. You've really lost information on the conformal field theory in some sense. The conformal field theory mainly serves to determine quantum mechanically the parameters in the ground state. And, and then you get, you know, you can open up your books on costless towers and, and dynamics of vortices near costless towers, for which there was a huge amount of work in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and all of that is purely classical equations of motion, and as it should be. Um, okay, so I just briefly mentioned that. And so now, of course, as I mentioned yesterday, in a different context, we want to think about the CFTs here. All right, so let me, um, okay, before I get there, I want to, one sneaky reason for introducing this is to make some points about duality uh, and gauge theories. So this looks like a very reasonable description. You have an auto parameter, in this case, it's the superfluid condensate, that's psi, and that has a relativistic field theory describing a condition, in this case, from an insulator to a superfluid. Um, and I've given you many other examples of this, but this particular theory is actually known to have a dual representation. Uh, first, pointed out really clearly by Das Gupta and Halperin. Uh, and that dual theory is a theory of uh, a field I call phi here, and it's actually the field that creates a vortex. Uh, of, so, so you have a, um, there's two ways of thinking about the system. In this way of thinking about it, you have word lines of particles and antiparticles. Uh, and in this way of thinking about your world lines of vortices, these are vortices in the superflow and anti-vortices. Uh, those are also relativistic because the number of vortices must equal the number of anti-vortices. But one important difference is the vortices have long-range forces. And this is realized in the, in the gauge theory, uh, sorry, in the field theory by a, a U1 gauge field. So, you know, here's a perfectly, uh, uh, you know, here's a system you start off, this is the Hubbard model, and this strongly interacting conformal field theory can be thought of as just a theory of a scalar field, or of a theory of scalar field with a gauge field, and they're exactly the same. So if I computed some entropy or some counted degrees of freedom, any way I want to think of it, I'm going to get the same answer. And this seems, you know, rather absurd from one perspective, because here I have a gauge field and here I don't, and the number of scalar fields is exactly the same. And that illustrates the danger in just, you know, something that you are actually, people do a lot in CFT2s, and there is certainly reasonable, just count up number of fermions and boson, number of modes, just tells you the central charge of that theory. Uh, there's no such thing here. It's a strongly coupled theory, and just by looking at the Lagrangian, you have really no idea what the degrees of freedom are, or even how many they are. Uh, and this, in this case, this, this correspondence is believed to be exact. Uh, at, at this quantum critical point in its vicinity. There's no proof of it. There's you know, numerical evidence and uh, you know, a lot of, lot of arguments based on lattice visualizations, uh, but it, you know, it seems to be reasonably well expected. There are supersymmetric generalization of these, the supersymmetric QED with n equals, yeah, I think it's n equals one, I think, or I forget. This is which uh, worked on by Strassler and Kapustin and others. Uh, which have exactly the same sort of relationship. This Where you can prove it. This yeah. is like the CPN story. The CPN? There's, this, you know, there's a story about CPN theories and you know, right in terms of gauge theories. Well, if I think I, I suspect you're referring to papers by uh, Witten and Dada in the, in the late so, so, no, that's a very different story. There, um, there you're talking about the massive CPN model, which at long distance has an emergent <coughs> and And there it's. Uh, you know, not as surprising. I mean, you can just integrate all the flows on the CFT. Uh, here is a statement about a conformal field theory. And it's in two plus one dimension. That was in one plus one dimension. Um, and, and, and the relationship, you know, the relationship with the field psi and these fields is rather, rather non-local. In fact, the field psi is a monopole operator in this field. Anyway, yeah. In the, in the second theory, one can add the Chun Simons term to it. Is there an equivalent uh, description on the top line? Uh, I think that probably, mm, add a Chun Simons term here. So, uh, you're going to break time reversal, so it's probably like adding a magnetic, fluctuating magnetic field or something. I'm not quite sure right away. Um, 
OK, no, no. If you add a Chern Simons term, the duality doesn't hold. So the Chern, if you add a theory with a the Chern Simons term, say coefficient theta, uh, its dual is a theory with a the Chern Simons term with coefficient minus 1 of, you know, there's like an SO, theta goes to 1 minus 1 over theta. Uh, but what's quite curious is so then you can say, well, maybe there's a self dual model. In fact, there is, there, if you look for the self dual model, it doesn't, it's not a sensible theory. There have been some wrong papers on this issue of the literature. There's nothing, so you can't find a self-dual model uh, here. Uh, because theta changes sign and goes to, you would say theta equals one is self-dual, but actually it goes to minus one. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, right, so this is F mu squared. So here, the, the gauge flux here uh, is like the density of the bosons. So this is like a, uh, it's, it's something like, you know, this size squared term roughly. It's the, no, it's density of bosons squared, so it's like the size fourth term roughly. But there's no, you can't, you can't just point the terms and they map, map onto each other. It's really a, a mapping of the full strongly coupled theory. Yes? I'm just trying to see how to match the global U1 uh, Right, so here uh, there's a global U1, uh, but here there's, there's a conserved flux. So d mu, there's a conserved current here, which is just the flux itself. And that's conserved. So that's. So, yes, yeah, so, oh, so, sorry, so this psi is a complex field on the first. They're both psi and phi are complex fields. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, right, so then that's the thing that becomes the global part of the U1 gauge invariance. Part. Um, so, let's say it again. So, the, this theory has one global U1. Yeah. This theory also has one global U1, and that's conservation of total flux. Right. This theory has a gauge U1, but the gauge U1 is totally yeah, fictitious. It doesn't have to appear. Yeah. Yeah, the global charges have to match, the gate charges don't. Yeah. Is this supposed to be just an infrared duality in the sense no. that these two theories flow to the same fixed point? Or uh, it depends on how you want to think about it, but it's a duality between two CF. So this has a fixed point, which is the uh, Wilson Fisher fixed point, if you right. put a cutoff. Uh, and this also has a fixed point, which is supposed to be the same. Then, it's more than that, I can take the fixed point here and do conformal perturbations in the leading relevant operator. Uh, which is this, which will describe a whole region. Yeah, right. And that also is exact. So the whole region. Is yeah, so that there's a correspondence between not just the conformal field theory, but all the operators. And, and you can just match the operators and match the full series in terms of the conformal perturbation theory relevant operators. And also irrelevant operators. Yeah, so but this is quite remarkable. I mean, they are, this is like a baby version of what string theory is called better symmetry and so on. But, here it was known in the 80s, and it's, it's a purely there's no supersymmetry or anything here. Yeah, no, it's very generic. Yeah. Never mind. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll become clear why I mentioned this. All right. So where am I? Oh, so now let's finally turn to ABS uh, Okay. So here's this is an older talk. I'm going to restate things I said on the board yesterday, and so I'll go somewhat quickly. As I said, the quantum critical region is where the relaxation times of order h bar over kt, and you get universal conductivities, uh, and you also get universal eta of s in principle. Uh, and to compute this, when you sit down to compute it, you take a Euclidean field theory, which is periodic in time, with period one over temperature. And in frequency space, this gives you a uh, response function at the Matsubara frequencies, which sit on the imaginary frequency axis. But we want the say the density density correlation function on the real axis. Uh, and so if you want them at high frequencies, that's quite easy to figure out. You just work it out here and analytically continue. That's not so difficult. Uh, and we get this answer, which I, I know I have a four floating around here because in this case, normally the boson that's even charged, if I'm thinking about the boson Hubbard model. Uh, and, and so I talked about this, this conformal response function, and that applies there, okay, at short times or high frequencies. Uh, notice here, at long enough times, no matter where I am, it's always just uh, hydrodynamics, diffusion, that's it. Uh, on the other hand, what we want to know is the answer here at small frequencies, and, and that's not easy to do by knowing by knowledge of the values at these discrete frequencies. Uh, and as I argued yesterday, the susceptibility or the density density correlation function is given by this form. Here, chi c is what I call dn d mu yesterday. 
uh, the charge compressibility and the conductivity by applying the Kubo formula here to this correlation function gives you is E squared times B times pi C. Now one can then ask, well, okay, what about these two quantities? How do they behave in this quantum critical region? Well, again, in the end, you, have, you can just figure it out by dimensional analysis. The only energy scale here that's important, it's a conformal fixed point, is the temperature. And then you also have a velocity, the velocity of light to play around. You just match then engineering dimensions, count powers of centimeters and seconds, and you will then conclude that the susceptibility is, must have this form, and the diffusion constant is, diffusion constant is you know, velocity squared or times time, so that's velocity squared and the time is h power over kt. Uh, and so, and these numbers, theta 1 and theta 2, are then some other universal numbers. And these are, you know, in a sense, far more complicated numbers to determine in, in some sense. Uh, because they are, have to do with hydrodynamic behavior rather than this number k here that I showed you yesterday, which is in principle easier to determine. Okay. Uh, and so there are two different conductivities. There's a the physical conductivity, which is this low frequency limit given by the diffusion relation, and, and this cuts moody like number, which is really a property of the high frequency conductivity. Okay, so now let's, so now I have given you the introduction of the physical ideas. Uh, what I'm going to do now, see, we'll, our point of view at this point will be, you know, I don't, I'm just going to pick, I want some CFT, I don't care which one, where I can solve solve for this. And for many years I would kept asking my particle theory friends, you know, is there some supersymmetric CFT where you can do this? And, uh, and the answer was, well, not really. But of course, then I learned from Sohn that uh, in ADS CFT you can. And so I was just, so we took the following field theory. Um, so here's, here's Mike and that's my way of thinking about it. You're going to take some, some Yang-Mills field theory. Um, and it's got uh, one coupling constant, called G squared, it's some gauge theory, F mu nu squared, and I'm going to be in 2 plus 1 dimensions, so it's be 2x B tau. And there's some matter, and uh, many other, you've got, I can't even remember how many things there are, but there's scalars of various types, and fermions and, and a gauge field. Uh, S U N C gauge field. Okay. Uh, and what supersymmetry does, if you take supersymmetry, uh, does for you, um, it tells, I think, is n equals a supersymmetry, there's only one coupling constant. Um, if I time things right, by the end of my lecture today, I will actually derive a model on the honeycomb lattice, which is, okay, which is a little closer in spirit to this, but given my discussion earlier, you know, I'm not too perturbed by adding a gauge field. I, you know, those come and go depending upon how you formulate the CFT. <laughs> I just want a CFT. Okay. So now, okay, so super simple from my perspective is that instead of having many different coupling constants, you know, my gross nouveau model had three or four coupling constants. Uh, it all puts them equal in some way, and you have only one left. All right, so now what is the RG flow of G? So in my naive way, I would just uh, do a, a power counting argument, the leading order, just count dimensions as a dimensionful constant, and under rescaling, it will go as 4 minus D. It's dimensionless in four dimensions, as you know. D is 2 plus 1 here, which is 3. So it's a relevant perturbation, so I really have to worry about it. So this means that the G equals zero fixed point, unlike electromagnetism, where I can work at small e, uh, even electromagnetism in two plus one dimensions is not a good place to start. Um, with photons, you have G is going to flow off somewhere, and we have to figure out where is it going to flow to. Okay, so uh, so the short answer is I think nobody really knows for this theory, but there is in incredibly good evidence for the following uh, fate of the flow of G. Correct me if I'm wrong. The experts in the audience will know more than I do. So what you, and so there are other terms here um, of order, well, let's see, I don't know, next term will be G cubed, and so on and so forth. Um, and I don't even know them. So 
one thing you can see from here is imagine if this sign was negative and you stop at that point. Of course, you don't have any control parameter to stop at order g cubed. You may have to include all the other terms. But suppose you had a beta function like this. What would the flow of g be? Well, then you have two fixed points uh, as a function of scale. This is g. Then g equals 0 as a fixed point. Well, that is you know, right inside is 0. That's a trivial fixed point. Um, and then, then you see that there's another fixed point if g is negative, uh, where, well, let's say the coefficient here both is 1. So there'd be a fixed point where g star is 1 in some, uh, some normalization. So this is g star equals 1. Uh, and now if you solve this equation, and look at the flow, well, the flow is extremely simple. Um, it's, it's just that. Okay. So this theory seems to be generic, if attractive to a conformal fixed point. Uh, and it's really supersymmetry that guarantees that. You know, in spirit, it's not so different from the gross nouveau type model that I talked about earlier. But there, to get a fixed point, I have to tune and couple of T. You know, I constantly have this T1 that I'm having to vary around. In some cases, I can see that I don't even, there are realization in condensed matter, but I don't even have to do that. But anyway, so far, the models I've considered, I had one relevant perturbations. Um, so the magical property of this theory is that there's a fixed point with zero relevant perturbations. No matter where you start, you end up in the conformal fixed point. OK. It's all phase. Huh? Yeah, it's a phase, as long as you maintain supersymmetry. Once you break supersymmetry, there are a lot of relevant perturbations. Okay, so that's, this is just a purely gauge theoretic perspective, but there's a, these are, can be realized in a string theory duo. Um, yeah. So, are there uh, explicit calculations at two loops to show that there's a G star fixed point? Um, I suspect there are, but maybe not of this theory, because for this theory, you know, people very quickly guess the answer based on supersymmetry and things like that. But I'm sure they're analogous calculations. Uh, some of the models I've mentioned later, there are calculations in this type where this does happen. Yeah. No, no. There's no control. <laughs> no. This is like at this point the way I've written it, this is a guess. And then you have to, so okay. So why isn't it if the, if the sign is minus, why isn't it a control? Four minus D. Well if okay, when D was D is close to four, there is a control. Well, okay. Right. But but not but D equals one. Right. If if D was if D was absolute 4 minus d was epsilon, this d star would be epsilon, then there would be a control. But okay. It's as usual. It's like the, you know, it's everything. Yeah, yeah, so, right. Um, so I, you know, I, in my, in, the, in this field theory, let me make an analogy. I'd like to make an analogy between this uh, and, and for the five-fold field theory, if I, if I had a relevant parameter, but if you allow me to always tune the relevant parameter to stay on the critical manifold, uh, then for the five-fold field theory, as, uh, as Leo is anticipating, well, I think suggested I should mention, <laughs> here there was, there was a quartic coupling U. You had a U phi to the fourth. And there also there were two fixed points. There was this fixed point, which we call the Gaussian fixed point. And then there was a non-trivial fixed point, which is the Wilson Fisher fixed point. And on this U axis, this was the point line connecting the two fixed points in my two dimensional phase diagram, the flow was identical to this. And this was about our epsilon in the epsilon expansion. <coughs> okay, so what I was going to say. So now this theory, uh, as you know better than I do, once you have a gauge here, you can realize, realize it on D brains. And this is a theory of, somebody tell me, two, type 2A or type 2B strict theory on a D2 brain. So that's this fixed point here. Two it. <laughs> and you know that's the, I guess the canonical way of getting a gauge theory on a D brain. Um, so you can also realize that it's some low energy limit of string here. So so this kind of analysis here, this very pedestrian analysis, tells us that this theory is this whatever theory you're beginning with is not stable. It's going to flow off somewhere else. Uh, and these are just words to me, but I guess what the conjecture is close to what people call the M2 brain, which has an, uh, an extra dimension appearing in it, 
Um, and in more recently, of course, people have found uh, this so-called ABJM formulation of the same theory. Here. Yes. Um, Correct me, please. The theory, yeah. The matter is such that the GQ term is zero. It's oh, is it? Okay. It, but if you take the D2 and you add in other grades, like D2, D6, I see. that drives that term so, uh, negative in your, in your conventions. I mean, but there are other terms, so maybe there's, but, well, but it's, it's still it's unstable, right? This is there. That's it. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's all I care about. Right, but there, so for D2 itself, I mean, I really, the, the fixed point really is a different one. I mean, it's a very special one that I'm not sure is really, but for D2, D6, yeah. this is, you get exactly the story in a controlled way. Um, I mean, so you're saying if I take a D2 brain this way, it's, it's so you, you agree it's unstable, or what does it flow to that? I, my understanding is it always flows to the same two brain. Yeah. yeah, but I wouldn't say it's usual. The string theory argument for that is, is yeah. to think of G actually just having that first term in it, yeah. flowing to infinity. Well, I know people tell me that, I don't tied like to, that. Tied to a string theory, <laughs> yeah. tied to a string theory and coupling equal to infinity. Yeah. Okay. So you think of that flowing to infinity by um, letting G string, which is the dimensionless yeah. quantity, go off to infinity. Right. And then we know type two-way string theory, and that limit is M theory. Well, that's the exactly what it is. So one is infinity. One is really land of the cutoff. It's the way it's a different. The way way of thinking about it, and the way you're thinking about it. I mean, when I when I say it's one, I mean it's over the cutoff. I really mean infinity. If, if you can formulate it either way. <laughs> Yeah, for us, it has to do with changing the. I know I had a long argument with the string theorists theory. on this point. Yeah, it's it's all of your definition of the natural scale from the string scale to the yeah, natural scale. Yeah, okay. But if I and then yeah. there's a dimensionless parameter, which is the yeah. ratio between those two scales. All right. What you're going to in this limit is that dimensionless parameter going to. Oh, okay. so you have another dimensional parameter, not a dimensional yeah. so full there parameter. Are two okay. scales, there's another scale. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm thinking of a scale with one scale where I can't make this distinction, I suppose. Yeah. So uh, if you uh, embed this into full okay. string theory, you get All right, great. But I guess you're gonna, you, you want this to be in two ways, you use that later, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm okay. It's going to. I certainly see, you know, I, I really slaved over many uh, string theory papers, and everyone seemed to say, well, the fixed point of this theory is the M2 brain theory. I'm just trying to give you my interpretation of that statement. That's true, but I'm not sure I would interpret that way. You have to field theory interpretation of given. No? Okay. No, okay, well, I, I, all right, great. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you're just going to work with this theory now, which is some kind of, I think this is correct, it's some kind of representation of the strong couple limit of super Yang mills. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Which is it not for the meaning? So how is this related to string theory? Does he have now? This. So this, uh, this is a. Dual well, the person who can explain is in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the lower degrees of freedom on some some brains, and that's all you. It's just that sector of the theory. Yeah. But but through the duality, it kind of knows about the ADS the duality. It knows about the whole of string theory. It's critically <coughs> Okay. Great. Um, so. Yeah, otherwise I think everything up here is correct. Uh, can I go? Right. Okay, I, I call it E here. I'm sorry, I call it E here. Single dimensionless coupling constant. Uh, okay, you know, we can debate whether it's infinity or not, but it's of order some other scale. Uh, and this CFT3 is, as you'll see by the if I time things right today, I think I might actually. Uh, re resemble certain critical spin liquid states that I'll discuss later. Uh, and then there's the ADS CFT duality, which maps this on in the large NC limit, where NC is this gauge number of gauge colors, to ADS4 cross S7. Uh, and, and this S7 you know, has, a, has a global SO8 symmetry, which in fact is not explicit in this theory. This has a smaller symmetry. So the final fixed point has a bigger symmetry, which is SO8 symmetry which has now become explicit in this new ABGM formulation. All of those statements are correct, I hope. <laughs> at, this, at the time we worked on this, this wasn't, this wasn't around. Um, all right, but that doesn't matter. All the, so now we just uh, you know, open the textbooks, and uh, it's really Sohn and Powell and 
Sean and Chris uh, showed me. You just compute certain correlation functions on ADS4 cross S7, and all will pop uh, the correlation functions of some conserved currents. In particular, here, I'm going to take this, uh, these R currents. So all the theories I mentioned so far had a global symmetry, which is basically U1 or SU. In the gross Nova model of U1 cross SU2, here is SO8. So we just take one of, uh, any one of these SO8 currents and just use the exactly the same techniques that Sohn has explained and compute the correlation function. Okay. And the remarkable thing is you can compute the correlation functions everywhere, here and there. Um, and, and you know, it, it's for someone who's done this previously by other method, it's really quite amazing how little sweat you have to, uh, uh, you know, how, how little you have to sweat to get the answer in both regimes. Uh, typically, you have to work much, much harder to get the answer in one regime. <laughs> Uh, all right, so so one difference from the calculation that anyway that Sohn showed, but, but Hong had these terms. Uh, so there you have an SO8 global symmetry. So as a consequence in the bulk, in the ADS4, uh, there is uh, an SO8 gauge field. So there's an SO8 gauge theory uh, living in, in, in ADS4. Now, this, and there's some gauge coupling G4D squared that's going to have an N squared up front. Uh, telling you that this thing is, uh, you can just treat it in a saddle point approximation. Now in that limit, when this G4D is small, effectively, the fact that it's, it's SO8 doesn't matter at all. And the the non the nonlinear terms here are less effective. They're down by factors of 1 over n squared, I guess. Um, and it just looks like 28 copies of an abelian gauge theory. All right, so you have some non abelian gates. So this is, this is again a very generic property from what I understand of theories with, a, in this case, uh, or CFTs with a Maxwell Einstein dual. There's a Maxwell term and an Einstein term, and the Maxwell term is just copies of, you know, in this case, 28 copies of Maxwell's theory. You don't have, the non abelian nature doesn't make any difference. Furthermore, it's in four dimensions. Now, in four dimensions, uh, as I'm sure you know, the Maxwell theory is soft dual. So this is going to connect to this duality I just discussed earlier for the boson Hubbard model or for the Seifold field theory. Um, 